Hey you, so today I'll review the part 4 of Epic History TV on Napoleon in Italy and today we'll talk about the famous bridge at Arcor. Let's go! October 1796 Six months have passed since General Napoleon Bonaparte took command of the French Army of Italy. In that time, he's led a series of brilliant operations against the Austrians and won a string of battles. Now he appears close to final victory. And remember, this campaign was like a distraction for the Austrians because the main operations were in the north, with the two main armies uh, fighting in the Rhineland. And now Napoleon stole the show and he's actually the one who has the, greater, who has the greatest chance of success. He's driven Austrian field forces off the plains of northern Italy, back towards the Alps. While his troops have the great fortress city of Mantua, the key to Italy, under close siege. Mantua's oversized Austrian garrison is nearing starvation and riddled with disease. Napoleon appeals to its commander, Field Marshal von Wurmser, to surrender. The brave should be facing danger, not swamp plague, he jibes. Let's remember some stuff. So Mantua is a very strong form fortress. It's surrounded by lakes and it has heavy walls. Napoleon does not have any, any siege artillery to quicken the outcome of the siege. Uh, so both of these guys are in a race uh, against time. Wurmser is uh, heavily entrenched there. He has a strong position but he's kind of in a trap. Uh, he has an overcrowded army in swamp uh, and with malnutrition they are suffering malaria. Remember these guys come from Austria, Hungary, Croatia. Their immune system is not suited for these conditions. And that's a big problem for armies at this period. But Wormser is a tough old veteran. He will not yield while any glimmer of hope remains. And he knows that to the north, Austria is gathering fresh troops to march to his aid. True, many are Grenz battalions, a type of Habsburg frontier militia, poorly drilled and short of officers. Grenz means if I recall correctly, frontiers. But they help raise the strength of the Austrian field army to 44,000. And they have a new general to lead them. Feldzeugmeister, or Lieutenant General, Josef Alvinci. The 61-year-old Hungarian was once military tutor to Emperor Francis himself, and is regarded as diligent, sharp and brave. He and his staff draw up plans for a fresh offensive to rescue Wormser and Mantua. Alvinci and Kostanovic will lead the main column, 26,000 strong, from Friuli to Bassano, then onwards to Mantua. Davidovich's corps, reinforced to 18,000, will retake Trento and push south through the Adige Valley. The two forces will link up at the earliest opportunity. Meanwhile, Wurmser, who can muster just 12,000 fit men from the Mantua garrison, will launch powerful sorties to pin down as many French units as possible. Napoleon, by contrast, has received very few reinforcements from France. His weary divisions are suffering from shortages and sickness and will be outnumbered on every front. Yes, 
and he will be outnumbered if he allows the enemy to take the initiative to regroup and to coordinate something they've never managed to do so far in this campaign. Alvinci begins his advance on the 22nd of October. The following day, the heavens open, drenching troops, swelling rivers and reducing roads to mud. For the time being, Napoleon is content to observe the enemy struggle forward in such conditions, knowing the effort will exhaust his infantry and disrupt supplies. On the 2nd of November, fighting breaks out north of Trento, where Napoleon has ordered Vaubois to attack. He wants to keep Davidovich bottled up, but Vaubois is heavily outnumbered, and his attack fails. Vaubois begins pulling back to Caliano, while Massena gives up Bassano and withdraws towards Vicenza. But now Alvinci's advance becomes strung out, slowed by the heavy rain and poor fitness of his recruits. And it is against Napoleon's nature to remain passive for so long. As the Austrians cross the Brenta, he orders Massena to attack General Lipte's division at Fontaniva, while Augereau attacks Hohenzollern at Bassano. The French launch dozens of separate assaults. But for all their poor march discipline, the Austrian recruits stand their ground and fight hard. With around 3,000 casualties on each side, the Second Battle of Bassano is the bloodiest day's fighting so far in the Italian campaign. And a failure for Napoleon. Hours later, he receives dire news from Vaubois. During heavy fighting at Caliano, some Croatian troops get behind the French line, triggering panic and a rout. Vaubois loses nearly half his division, killed, wounded or missing, before he can regroup at Rivoli. So that's one tenth of Napoleon's army gone. And that's also more than the total reinforcement is received since the beginning of the campaign. I, if I recall correctly, he received only three, something like 3,500 fresh troops when the Austrians were able to bring up three uh, fresh armies during this whole time. The French are falling back on all fronts. And unless Napoleon can conjure something remarkable, he seems destined to suffer a major strategic defeat. So it's the first time Napoleon shows up discontent in his troops. And I imagine that the effect it had on the soldiers was kind of heavy. If you really want to yell at someone, you have to be legitimate to do so. And he is, for his rebuild this army and is impressed the soldiers with its energy and its competence and on top of everything the most important thing is that he brought them success and as napoleon says himself success is the greatest talker so he has impact when he has to uh, to show uh, that he's angry towards its soldiers Napoleon's position is perilous, but his enemy's cautious pursuit affords him some respite. Four whole days pass while Alvinci and Davidovich coordinate their next moves. It's not a delay Napoleon would have tolerated if the shoe had been on the other foot. When the Austrians finally advance, it's bungled. 
Hohenzollern's vanguard approaches Verona to investigate reports of a French retreat. This isolated division is too tempting for Napoleon to ignore. He orders Augereau and Massena to attack. They inflict 400 casualties, but Hohenzollern escapes to a ridge near Caldiero. The next day, Napoleon orders renewed attacks. But conditions are atrocious. The French struggle uphill into driving rain and hail, their boots slipping in the mud, under fire from Austrians dug in on the ridgetop. Around noon, Colonel Dupuis' 32nd Demi Brigade finally gets onto the ridge. It looks like the French may be able to lever the Austrians out of their position. But then, the Austrian army begins to arrive in force, to support Hohenzollern's hard-pressed division. The French are in danger of being outflanked on both wings. They take up new defensive positions, and hold the line until darkness when Napoleon cuts his losses and orders a retreat to Verona. It has been an unequivocal French defeat. Napoleon's first in battle. And imagine that, so for the moment, Napoleon is just a young general basically unknown, but a couple of years after, maybe Al Vinci must have looked back to this victory with kind of a sense of pride. The following day, he writes furiously to the Directory in Paris. He has no doubt that they are to blame for his defeat, for repeatedly failing to send reinforcements. We may be on the verge of losing Italy, None of the expected help has arrived. The army of Italy, reduced to a handful of men, is worn out. The heroes of Lodi, Millesimo, Castiglione and Bassano have died for their country or are in the hospitals. The men have nothing left but their reputation and their pride. We are abandoned in the depths of Italy. So basically, he's fighting with the same guys since six months. Uh, remember that when he took charge of his army, it was only a bunch of unequipped, uh, demoralized guys, and he made it into a formidable war machine. But he does not have superpowers. He's just a man after all. So if he doesn't receive support from its superiors, he's done. And as I said, he's only a young guy with an immense pressure on his shoulders. So, yeah, at some point you, you need to, uh, to also yell at your superior. But despite his apparent despair, Napoleon has already devised a plan to strike back. A breathtakingly bold move that will spawn one of the greatest of Napoleonic legends. With the Austrians converging on Verona, Napoleon decides to risk everything on a daring surprise attack. Leaving Macard to cover Verona, he will circle south with the rest of the army, cross the Adige River and swing north, threatening to cut Alvinci's lines of communication and capture his artillery, baggage and supplies. Such losses will force Alvinci to abandon his advance. Marching overnight, Augereau and Massena arrive undetected at Ronco. Augereau's men cross the Adige on a pontoon bridge and begin moving north. But with marshland on all sides, they have to stick to the narrow, raised causeway just 20 yards wide. And when they reach up. 
Last week I passed, uh, I passed by a call. I was on a road trip in Italy and unfortunately I couldn't vlog there because I had no time to do so. But uh, the terrain there is very, very hard. It's a steep terrain with swamps, river, a lot of vegetation. Just by looking at this map, you can see how difficult it is to have a battle there. And yes, it was. I was wondering how come they were able to maneuver and outflank their enemies there. Yeah, impressive. Arcole, where they must cross the bridge to continue north, they find it held by two Croatian battalions. Horribly exposed on the causeway, and under heavy fire, the French troops take cover behind its reverse slope. Reinforcements are sent up, but they too are pinned down by the weight of fire from the far bank. Colonel Lann had discharged himself from hospital that morning in order not to miss the battle. He now attempts to lead a charge, but is hit in the leg. The fiery Augereau refuses. And it's one of many, many woods Lann will suffer. He'll die in a decade in horrible conditions at Esslings. And Yes, Napoleon was not the only guy who led by example. Its generals were really, really brave and often display incredible courage to inspire their men. ...is to accept defeat and orders another attack. But his men are exhausted and demoralized, with three generals wounded. The attack at Arcole has stalled. When Alvinci hears gunfire from the south, he assumes the French are making a feint to divert him from his own planned attack on Verona. But then comes alarming news that the French have crossed the Adige in force and are behind his left flank. He sends two brigades to attack the French bridgehead and diverts Mitrovsky to reinforce Arcole. Masena's division, moving northwest to protect the flank of the advance, runs straight into the Austrians at Bionde. At first, the Austrians have the better of it. But a disastrous friendly fire incident triggers panic, and Masena drives the Austrians back up the causeway. And it seems to me that, like, it's a uh strong tradition within the Austrian army because eight years before that they had the Battle of Karanchebes where they basically started to fight uh, each other and lost basically a battle to themselves. Honestly guys, go check it out. The story is hilarious. Napoleon is increasingly concerned by the holdup at Arcole. If they cannot break through, Alvinci will have ample time to redeploy and prevent any advance. He now orders General Gear to take two regiments, cross the Adige at Albaredo, and lead them up the eastern bank of the Alpone River to hit Arcole from the south. He himself rides to the bridge to try to get the attack moving. He finds hundreds of French troops sheltering behind the causeway, unwilling to face the Austrian fire. General Augereau grabs a standard and begins to advance. This highly romanticized depiction was painted two years later. Grenadiers, he cries, come and seek your colour. In reality, none had the courage to follow him. Then, the commander of the Army of Italy himself draws his sabre, picks up a standard, and runs forward. There is withering fire all around. Several men fall wounded. His aide-de-camp, Colonel Mouron, is killed. Another aide-de-camp, a Polish officer named Sulkowski recalls, The soldiers saw him, 
and none of them imitated him. I was witness to this extraordinary cowardice, and I cannot conceive it. And it's absolutely not how Bonapartist propaganda will sell this story. Basically, and it is still a myth in the collective mind of the French, Napoleon takes the standard, urges his troop to follow him, and then cross the bridge in this famous heroic and furious charge. And yeah, it's still very, very much alive in our minds. And I, I think I'll put a link to, um, to a part of a uh, French series on Napoleon where this episode is depicted and you will see how different it is from the reality. Honestly, it's amazing. With the French infantry refusing to follow their officers, the assault on the bridge ends in abject failure. A well-timed Austrian counter-attack drives them back down the causeway. In the rout, Napoleon's horse loses its footing. He tumbles into the swamp and has to be hauled out by his aides. That evening, General Gear launches his attack on Arcole from the south. The defences are less formidable on this side, and his men fight their way into the village. Arcole, at last, has fallen. But that night, Gear's men are ordered to pull back. Napoleon is preparing to retreat. If, as he expects, Davidovich has continued his advance down the Adige Valley, Napoleon must withdraw now or face encirclement. His bold manoeuvre appears to have failed. Then, at 4 a.m., Napoleon receives a report from Rivoli that changes everything. Not only does Vaubois still hold the town, he hasn't even been attacked yet. Napoleon's line of retreat remains secure for at least a few days more. It's all the reassurance he needs. He immediately cancels his retreat and issues orders to attack. Napoleon has lost the element of surprise, and Dalvinci is now planning his own counter-attack. And the element of surprise was kind of its own advantage, because once again on the paper things look kind of disparate for Napoleon. He's committed in a very difficult battle at Arcole with the weak position, and he has fresh troops against him. And moreover, time is running against him. Overnight, his troops edge forward. Provera to Belfiore di Porcile, Mitrovsky back into Arcole. Both armies are on the move before dawn. Massena sends skirmishers into the marshland. When the Austrians arrive, bunched up on the causeway, they make easy targets. After a sharp fight in which an Austrian general is killed, Massena's men are driving the enemy before them. Augereau, however, cannot get close to Arcole. The causeway is still swept by Austrian musket fire and canister from across the Alpone. Napoleon orders troops to cross downstream at Albaredo, but the Austrians now have two battalions guarding the crossing point. French attempts to float or swim across the river come to naught. Day two of the battle ends in stalemate. Many soldiers have to camp amid the marshes and get what food and rest they can. Napoleon will try once more to break through. But he is running out of time.
Davidovich, who by now has received several urgent requests from Alvinci to advance, finally attacks on the 17th of November. Vaubois's outgunned division breaks. The Austrians take Rivoli and 1,000 prisoners, and nearly capture Vaubois himself. With Davidovich on the move at last, Napoleon must force a decision at Arcalay, or retreat. The bridge at Arcalay has proved too tough to crack. So Napoleon switches tactics. Augereau's division will cross the Alpone and attack Arcalay from the south in force. A column is sent 10 miles south to cross at Lenyago and then race back up the eastern bank to support him. Massena will advance up the causeway in support, while also protecting the left flank. That night, the French assemble a pontoon bridge over the Alpone. Augereau's division begins crossing before dawn. But at sunrise, Austrian gunners in Alberedo spot the bridge and score a hit, knocking it out of action. Only the 51st Demi Brigade is across, though it gamely begins to advance on Arcoli. Massena's advance is also hamstrung by a broken pontoon bridge. To add to the crisis, the Austrians launch an attack on the fragile French bridgehead. Napoleon gathers every available gun to blast the Austrians, who fall back under a withering barrage. The bridges are quickly repaired. And the French military engineers are particularly effective because before the fall of the old regime, it was uh, alongside with artillery, one field where if you were not noble, uh, you could uh, make a career because it was considered as, uh, you know, more technical and less prestigious arms. And the engineers will play a significant role in many battles, for example, you have the Berezina in Russia, uh, where they sacrifice themselves in order to build up a pontoon, which allows the army to escape and avoid total destruction. But as the French advance, they encounter stubborn opposition on both sides of the Alpone. A bloody seesaw battle surges back and forth along the causeways. Neither side can deploy its troops, nor gain an advantage. Around 3pm, the French column from Lenyago arrives, threatening to turn the Austrian flank. Just as Arcole seems about to fall, the Austrians launch a ferocious counter-attack across the bridge. Brigadier General Robert is killed. His troops fall back in disarray. The panic is contagious. Augereau's men lose their nerve and fall back to the bridge. The moment of crisis has arrived. But while the enemy has just used his last reserves, Napoleon can call on Massena's unengaged troops, including the elite 32nd Demi Brigade. Their sudden counterattack turns the tide. Massena's men sweep up the causeway, taking scores of prisoners, as Augereau's division resumes its advance. As they approach Arcalay, Napoleon arranges a small ruse de guerre. 25 of his elite escort sweep in from the east blowing bugles to feign a mass cavalry charge. So that's maybe my favorite move of the whole Italy campaign, uh, when Napoleon sent these guys 
uh, with a form far and order them to play very loudly uh, military march in order to trick the Austrians into thinking that numerous enemy is arriving and so they are going to, to flee and that's genius. In the evening light, it's enough to scare the remaining garrison into abandoning the village. As the French continue their advance, Alvinci orders his exhausted, demoralized army to retreat east, to Montebello, to protect its lines of communication. The three-day battle of Arcole has been a messy, bloody affair, with no great tactical flourishes. Napoleon's margin of victory is narrow, and a third of his army are casualties. But he has done enough. For now. That reminds me of an overcrowd of Napoleon. I know he's a great general, but is he lucky? Alvinci may be withdrawing, but Davidovich remains a threat. The next day, Napoleon sets off at his customary pace with Massena's division to reinforce Vaubois. Augereau takes a different route to threaten the Austrians' line of retreat. The confusion that follows between Alvinci and Davidovich verges on farce. Alvinci writes to his corps commander, informing him that he will support him by resuming his advance. But Davidovich, having heard of the defeat at Arcole and now directly menaced by Napoleon, is already retreating. On receiving Alvinci's letter, however, he tries to turn his army around, leading to such chaos that he has to immediately countermand that order and resume his retreat. The end result is that both Austrian armies are soon withdrawing. And with exquisitely poor timing, gallant old Wurmser chooses this moment to launch his supporting attack from Mantua. He does at least secure some much-needed supplies, at a cost of 800 casualties. And coordination at this point of history is immensely difficult, even on the battlefield sometimes, is making sure that um, you have well-timed operation between your different units. Um, for example, see the infamous Charge of the Light Brigade in the Crimean War, where a simple order is altered every time it is passed, and then it results in a complete blunder with this uh, insane charge. Another example that jumps into my mind as a French is during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Uh, so like 70 years after that, uh, the city of Paris is besieged by the Prussian army. And you have several occasions where it might have been possible to break up this encirclement if the relief army and the besieged army managed to strike together to coordinate. Uh, they never managed to do so. So, yeah, coordination, very difficult. It has been a bruising campaign for Napoleon. By some estimates, he has lost more men than the Austrians. He has suffered his first defeat in battle and won a costly, messy victory at Arcole. But he has beaten the odds and thrown back the enemy. What's more, his heroic conduct at the bridge at Arcole will soon take on a life of its own. Artists and pamphleteers turn a slightly embellished version of events into a sensational piece of personal PR that captivates France. With Napoleon's active encouragement, the world is witnessing the birth of the Napoleonic legend. A powerful force 
that will inspire loyalty and devotion for many years to come. History is written by the winners, right? So what we remember from this battle at Arcoli is these paintings with this heroic behavior from Napoleon and not the, no, I, w I won't say the cowardice, but the, the unwillingness of its men to follow him. For now, both armies settle into winter quarters, as December brings bitter cold and heavy snow to northern Italy. In Mantua, the Austrian garrison is near its limit. Starvation beckons, though Wurmser is determined to hold out to the last. The Austrians will have one last chance to save the city. A final offensive to decide the outcome of the war in Italy. So, that was close, huh? As always, guys, thanks for listening. Part 5 coming very soon, and I really hope this time will take Mantua. Bye.